In a recent hearing, Sarah Boone, the defendant in the Florida case, many people are calling the suitcase murder case, has just been appointed her eighth attorney after her seventh appointed attorney requested to withdraw. This is a case that I haven't yet talked about on this channel, but I've been following it for a while. So I was like, why am I not making content about this case? Anyway, if you're not familiar with it, Boone is accused of murdering her boyfriend, Jorge Torres, back in 2020 by zipping him up in a suitcase and leaving him to essentially suffocate. She alleges that it was basically a drunken game of hide and seek gone wrong, and that when she went to bed that night, she didn't realize that he was still in the suitcase and couldn't get out. However, there is video footage of the event in question, which she took herself. So, Sarah, I can't breathe, babe. Sarah, is he? Yeah, that's when you do when you choke me. Now, since her arrest, the court has appointed attorney after attorney to represent her. In fact, as of the end of this latest hearing, Boone has now been appointed her eighth attorney to represent her. Each of the first seven attorneys requested to withdraw for various reasons, but usually because of some kind of irreconcilable differences. And along with those withdrawals, usually came some kind of continuance of the trial date. But because of the attorney-client privilege and because that privilege is held by the client and not the attorney, meaning it can be waived, but generally only by the client and not the attorney, there's only so much that any of these attorneys can say without revealing information that gets into that privilege. So really, we can't ever know for sure what any of these specifics are on why Boone's relationships with these various attorneys has broken down time and again, maybe for the same reasons, maybe for different reasons. But we can try to basically read between the lines and get an idea of what may be happening. These attorney withdrawals are also usually accompanied by letters Boone writes to the court complaining about her attorneys. These complaints usually range from her claiming that they don't communicate enough with her, alleging that they'll go months without returning a call, to complaining about wanting to be at a hearing where her attorney has waived appearance for both of them. And again, because of the attorney-client privilege, a lot of these claims are hard for any attorney to rebut without getting into those privileged communications. As for this latest motion to withdraw, it was filed on February 1st with her attorney, Winston Hobson, noting a few reasons as to why he was requesting withdrawal. For one thing, despite Boone's claims in a recent letter to the judge saying that she wasn't given enough communication from Hobson, Hobson recounted in his motion all of the work he's done in the case so far to include his meeting with her both in person and over video. And perhaps more interestingly, he said in his motion that irreconcilable differences, including but not limited to ethical considerations, have arisen in this case between the defendant and counsel, and it is in the best interest of the defendant that counsel be allowed to withdraw and the case reassigned to other counsel in his stead. In other words, there was some sort of ethical dilemma that arose in the course of this representation that basically meant that any step moving forward together with the case was probably going to be a huge issue under the attorney ethical rules in Florida. What it was that caused that ethical dilemma, we will probably never know exactly because, again, the attorney-client privilege prevents us from knowing for sure. We can have our suspicions and maybe piece together what we think happened based on the information we have, but I want to caution people before they go too hard in the paint with something like this. We never have the full story on things like this, and so we can never be too confident on what actually happened. That said, although I haven't been able to find the entirety of the hearing, there was a local news outlet that recorded at least snippets from the hearing. And those snippets included some interesting things that were said at this hearing. And so here's what they showed of some of the back and forth between Hobson and Boone in front of the judge at the hearing on Hobson's withdrawal. I would say Ms. Boone has some ideas about what should be done, should not be done. I don't agree with those. Some things she wants done, they won't do. But when 100 days have passed and I haven't heard or said or done anything other than try to figure out where you are because your phone doesn't work, I'm not a bad person because of that. So like I said, although we can't know for sure, what it sounds like the attorney is suggesting is Boone asked Hobson to do something maybe illegal or unethical. And he said, no, we're not doing that. And maybe she insisted on that course of action. Again, this is my interpretation based on the statements provided in this clip. My thoughts on that might change if I get access to the full hearing. This might be a clip that would appear differently in a fuller context, for example. 
But based on what we can see, this is how it currently looks to me. And you know, it happens from time to time. You can have a client that suggests maybe getting bendy with the facts in their favor. They might suggest making something up, maybe hiding evidence, uh, not producing it, not disclosing it, or even offering to lie on the stand. These are just examples. I'm not saying that any of that happened here, but it does happen sometimes. And as the attorney, you have an ethical obligation not to go along with falsifying information or misleading the court. And so if something like that arises, you as the attorney have to have a conversation with the client and say, we're not doing that because we can't do that. Don't get me wrong. Your case is very, very important to me, but it's not so important to me to risk my entire law license and by extension, my entire career. And the client can either say, okay, fine, we'll do it your way. And maybe that's enough for the attorney to look at the client and go, okay, this funny business is behind us. Let's put together your case and move forward. Or maybe the attorney doesn't trust the client at that point and still wants to withdraw because maybe they think that the client is going to kind of go back on what they're saying if they're saying, okay, we'll, we'll do it your way. Or the other option is the client actually digs their heels in and says, nope, it's this way or no way. This is my life. This is my case. You can take it or leave it. And if that's the case, the lawyer really has no choice but to withdraw. And that's because the lawyer has an ethical duty not to mislead the court, but they also have an ethical duty to zealously advocate on behalf of their client. And in that kind of a situation, you simply can't do both at the same time. That's because moving forward in a way that doesn't mislead the court basically requires you, in a sense, not to zealously advocate on behalf of your client and vice versa. So that places the attorney at an ethical impasse and withdrawal is basically the only option. And so here, interestingly, the court did in fact decide to appoint a new attorney. A lot of people have had questions about when the judge is going to decide that enough is enough. And, you know, maybe Sarah Boone has to represent herself if she can't work with any other attorneys. But so far, we have not reached that point. And now we have Patricia A. Cashman, who is now Boone's eighth attorney. After seeing this brief snapshot of her here and looking at her firm website, which goes into some of her history, I don't know if you've been following along with us in the classic trials as we go through the Menendez brothers 1993 trial, but I'm getting a slight Leslie Abramson vibe here. Abramson represented Eric Menendez and was a total hurricane of an advocate, absolute badass trial attorney. People either love her or hate her because she had a no-nonsense, admittedly a bit aggressive of a style. If you've been watching this channel, you probably know that I'm not naturally like that myself. So I admittedly am somewhat in awe of her advocacy style. And there's something about female attorneys who like grew up professionally speaking in the 1970s, 80s, and even 90s that in my opinion made them tough as nails. They're a very particular breed in my opinion. In comparison, you know, you can ask today, does misogyny exist in the legal profession? Sure, that probably exists in some form in every industry in the world. I personally have experienced some of it myself, but by and large, in my experience at least, it's really on the margins. But that said, these days there are many, many more female attorneys than there were back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Law schools, last I checked, are filled with students that are more than 50% female these days. But the women who became attorneys in the 70s, 80s, and 90s had a very different experience. There were far, far fewer of them in the practice of law, generally speaking. You'll hear stories about how they said that they were often discounted because of their biology. Stereotypes were abound about women being too emotional to hold certain positions or to be trusted with something like trial trial litigation work um, or a number of other examples. And so what I've noticed is that those female attorneys who were forged in that environment, similar to women who were in other very male-dominated professions at various points in time, are generally very, very tough and very straightforward and very no-nonsense. And a lot of that was because in order to thrive in such a male-dominated environment, they kind of had to be like that. And folks can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong about this, but Patricia Cashman, to my knowledge, is Boone's first female appointed attorney. So although this is the eighth attorney here, and I can see that probably no one is holding their breath for this appointed attorney to actually stick to the case and make it all the way through trial, I think there is a chance that we could see something different happen here. 
Cashman could be a particular breed of attorney that has the ability to take charge of the relationship with a client like Boone and to whip the case into shape for trial. And I'm saying this after looking through her website in particular. She's got a whole interview section where she talks about her experiences and basically growing up during that time period and a lot of the challenges that she's had to work through in the process. But we'll see. What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below. Now, another thing that was interesting about this hearing in particular is that the judge also said that at this time, he was not going to be continuing the trial date. So far, it is still scheduled to begin on May 3rd of this year. Looking at the clips from the hearing that are publicly available, we don't really have any major context for why exactly he determined that. But it could be that he decided that Hobson had done a lot of work on the case, enough to keep things moving forward, and that Cashman should be in a decent position to be able to move forward to that date. Now, on the other hand, it could also be a signal to Boone saying trial is coming and we're not going to be shifting things much more than this. Now, I don't know if the judge admonished Boone about any further appointed counsel if this new relationship doesn't work. But he did say that Boone has had a hard time maintaining relationships with her attorneys. Seemingly all of your relationships with counsel have deteriorated. So this judge could be signaling to her, hey, this is it. Make it work or represent yourself. Or on the other hand, maybe he's just holding on to the trial date unless and until Cashman just gets some time to look through the file and then files a motion to continue the trial so that she can get properly sped up on it. Honestly, either one is possible. This is a relatively new judge to this case, so we don't know what his tendencies are with regard to extending timelines. Maybe he'll grant a continuance freely, or maybe he's a bit more of a stickler for keeping to the calendar as it's set. Only time will tell. But those are my thoughts. What do you think? Is there a chance that we actually get to see this trial happen in May? Or do you expect the other shoe to drop and maybe we see another continuance soon? Let us know in the comments down below. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this or at least found it interesting or informative. And if you did, I would love it if you could hit the like button. It does help us with the YouTube algorithm gods. And if you're new here and you want to see more content like this, more trial updates, more pre-trial updates on these kinds of cases, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can find out when the next video is uploaded. See you in the next one.